Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Our lovely new podium means that all our words will be caught. I will try not to be too loud for all our friends watching online. Um, today, we're very excited to have an event on the new book, Confronting Inequality. Whoops, I should hold up the book. With a memorable canary yellow cover. Confronting Inequality, How Societies Can Choose Inclusive Growth. This is by our colleagues Andrew Berg, Prakash Langani, and Jonathan Austri of the IMF. Um, this is just one sign and a particularly important sign of the kind of free thinking that the IMF has been engaging in over the last several years. It is not a secret that some of this started while our colleague Olivier Blanchard was director of the research department. Um, but credit to the three authors and their colleagues for really moving the ball forward on an issue where people have many things they want to believe about inequality and growth, but trying to establish what we actually know about inequality and growth. And that's a huge advance. Um, I will introduce some of our speakers in a moment, uh, but just I'm going to do the rare thing of indulging in a bit of institutional comments um, we have tried through the years to do work on inequality and growth, but to be honest, our work has not come up to the level of this book, and I'm very pleased to be interacting with the fund and its researchers on this topic, and we hope we can continue exchange. I will say, however, that um, we are proud to make two announcements that uh, I hope will help us in this endeavor. Uh, the first is that uh, the previous economic counselor and director of research at the fund, Professor Maury Obstfeld of UC Berkeley, will be joining us as a non-resident fellow starting tomorrow. Um, this continues a proud tradition we have of not every time, but most times, uh, bringing in the former chief economist of the fund, of course, Olivier Blanchard, the late Michael Musa, our non-resident affiliate, Simon Johnson, and others. Uh, so we are very pleased to continue this and continue the kind of forward-thinking, broad-minded research that, that Maury and Olivier have done with their colleagues at the fund. The second thing I'd like to announce is in our world of think tanks, one of our big news dropped today. Um, the think tank go to global go to index, which is the uh, not quite the Academy Awards, more the People's Choice Awards of think tanks, was released. And uh, this morning, and for the fifth year in a row, the Peterson Institute for International Economics was ranked number one globally for international economics. Thank you. It is a tribute to everyone here and the community of mutually supportive, mutually respectful, but always challenging research that we've achieved that. And we're grateful for our partners and friends in the think tank community and the official sector who've let us do that. Let me now return though to this critical book, Confronting Inequality, How Societies Can Choose Inclusive Growth. Uh, we're going to be have the lead-off presentation of the book by Jonathan Austry, who is currently Deputy Director of the Research Department at the IMF. He's been very influential internally and externally in shifting the debate on these issues. He's published a number of things, including recently Taming the Tide of Capital Flows, another area where the fund has notably shifted its thinking based on empirical reality. Um, his co-authors, Prakash Vangani, is assistant director of the IMF's Independent Evaluation Office. He's very well known for some of his work on the difficulty of forecasting recessions. And then Andrew Berg, who is deputy director of the IMF's Institute for Capacity Development. He's previously been at the U.S. Treasury and is chief economist of the Mexican Task Force, notably in 95-96, a true public servant. We're going to follow immediately upon Jonathan's initial presentation with comments from Heather Bushi, the executive director and chief economist of the Washington Center for Equitable Growth, 
Many people know her from her past work on the Hillary Clinton transition team that we wish had transitioned, um, and as economists, both for the Center for American Progress and Joint Economic Committee of the U.S. Congress. I will allow Heather's additional time if she wishes to cite how well uh, Washington Center for Equitable Growth is doing in the think tank rankings, too. And then finally, among the discussants will be Jason Furman, who is one of our notable non-resident senior fellows and also, of course, professor of practice of economic policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. He spent eight years in the Obama administration, including as the chair, 28th chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors. So thank you all very much for joining us today. I will turn it over to Jonathan, then Heather, then Jason, and then all the authors will join us on stage. Good. Well, good afternoon, and my sincere thanks to uh, Adam and to the Peterson Institute for hosting us today, and also to Heather and Jason for having taken the time to read the book um, and to offer us their uh, wisdom uh, in the course of the discussion today. Um, I, uh, I should start by saying that this book gives you, in one place, uh, a summary of our our findings from a decade of research on uh, inequality issues in a non-technical and user-friendly way. Uh, my talk, likewise, is going to be non-technical. Uh, but for those of you interested in the underlying research, uh, the papers are in the uh, public domain, uh, typically in peer-reviewed journals that are cited in the book. Uh, I hope that my remarks will make you uh, go out and buy the book rather than deciding you don't have to. Um, the book's topic uh, really doesn't need uh, much motivation. We've seen protest after protest over the past 20 years in which the elite has been taken by surprise that people care not just about the average effects of policies, but about how those policies affect them. While the Yellow Vest protests are the latest uh, incarnation and the protests are about uh, seemingly about um, uh, how do uh, the distributional effects of uh, policies designed to mitigate climate change, when we started working on these issues, the headlines were, were different. And, and here I think about the Occupy movements whose slogan was, uh, we are the 99% or uh, at a, in a similar period, the Arab Spring, uh, where the protesters were, uh, were protesting against a lack of equity uh, in the region. If you go uh, still further back, uh, uh, many of you will remember the, um, the anti-globalization protests at the WTO meetings in Seattle uh, some 20 years ago. To our mind, there is a common thread across these different uh, protests, uh, which is that um, the distributional effects of policies matter. And some might say they matter even more uh, than the average or aggregate effects on which uh, our profession uh, uh, tends to dwell so much. Our book uh, has um, three messages. Um, I should have had this slide up with the reviews uh, while I was speaking, but our book has three messages. Um, the first is that uh, inequality undercuts the sustainability of economic growth. More unequal societies tend to experience more fragile growth. So if a goal of policy is to achieve extended periods of healthy growth, it behooves us to not let inequality get out of hand. Second message, broad global trends like integration and technology don't completely determine a country's fate as far as inequality is concerned. Policy choices, including in the realm of policies the IMF regularly advises governments about, have an important impact on inequality outcomes. And third, there is too much concern about too much caution, I should say, about using redistributive fiscal tools in terms of their possible disincentive effects. On the whole, 
the macro data strongly suggest that redistributive policies have done more good than harm. So let me begin by saying something about a key cost of inequality in terms of less sustainable growth. My guess is that when we think about the costs of inequality, social and moral costs spring to mind first. We may also think about political capture, an issue that Joe Stiglitz has repeatedly emphasized, which is often associated with high levels of inequality. Our focus in the book is different and dwells on the economic costs of inequality. We appreciate this is a very complex issue on which many of you will say there has been decades of seemingly fruitless debate. In our defense, I would mention that we have looked at the issue from a fresh perspective that does not rely on panel growth regressions, which we think have serious shortcomings in terms of being able to identify growth drivers when growth is not a smooth process, which happens to be the case for most countries. Instead, we look for commonalities across countries that are enjoying reasonably long periods of healthy growth, typically following a period of poor performance, and ask what factors protect this good performance i.e. what factors reduce the hazard that the good performance will come to an end. So we try and answer the question, what makes growth sustained? Or conversely, what leads to fragile growth? Our answer, which is given on this slide, involves many factors that will be familiar to all of us. Factors that in the eyes of some will be associated with the Washington Consensus. Examples of policies or institutions that lead to sustained growth include free trade, democratic institutions, openness to foreign direct investment, a competitive exchange rate, and moderate amounts of external debt. So these are in the bars, all the bars except the first one on that picture. But what really struck us when we did this work more than a decade ago and here I give a, a, a big nod to Jeremy Zettelmeyer, who was our co-author and colleague at the time, was that more equal societies tended to have a lower hazard rate. That is, they tended to, to be able to grow at healthy clips for much longer periods of time. Being relatively equal at the beginning of a growth spell, or taking steps during the growth spell to rein in inequality if it gets out of, out of hand, seems to protect growth. Inequality and fragile growth seem to be two sides of the same coin. And the effects are large and highly robust, holding up to a range of other controls in the model. Equality, like the Washington consensus variables, seems to belong in the pantheon of factors that economists and policymakers should think about when they develop strategies to sustain growth. Going for growth, a mantra that we've all heard before, while assuming that inequality will simply take care of itself, seems to us to be a dangerous gamble that might end up frustrating the very goal of durably raising the size of the pie. Sustained growth requires a focus on both growth and distribution. Okay, so let me switch now and talk a little bit about some causes of inequality. There's a widespread view that rising inequality simply reflects broad trends like technology and integration, trade, which are difficult for an individual country to resist, or where resisting would obviously be a misarising. This book looks at whether factors beyond these broad global trends are also important drivers of inequality. We ask in particular whether the macro and structural policies on which we provide regular policy advice to governments also play a role. Unlike broad global trends, countries have discretion they are free to choose within limits how to design these policies 
so as to balance efficiency and equity considerations. To be sure, the primary targets of many of these policies is growth rather than equity. But attention to the equity effects may nevertheless be warranted because if pursuit of growth policies results in higher inequality, the hit to equity could end up circling back and undercutting growth. This is not to advocate diminished enthusiasm for policies to boost the supply potential of the economy. It is merely saying that in designing reform packages, countries should ensure that winners and losers across the di different elements of these packages balance each other out. And if a policy has only a small benefit for economic growth, but, but hurts inequality a lot, that policy deserves a rethink. So what I'm going to do in the next few minutes is talk about a couple such policies. There are five, five policies and institutions that are looked at in the book. I'm going to focus on just two of them now. One is financial globalization and the other is fiscal consolidation. Some call this austerity. So financial globalization is an issue that others have been thinking deeply about for many decades, including important work by Danny Roderick, published by the Peterson Institute more than 20 years ago. It seems odd to us, therefore, that recent debates about globalization and the fact that it hasn't worked for all have focused almost entirely on trade and to some extent migration. We believe that financial globalization needs to be brought into the conversation about, about how to achieve a more inclusive globalization. Some aspects of the issue, especially how to make capital account crises less costly and less likely, are covered in a book that Adam kindly mentioned that my, my colleagues and I published last year called Taming the Tide of Capital Flows. Here, though, my focus is going to be squarely on the equity efficiency trade-offs inherent in global financial integration. In the book, we try and improve on existing empirical methodologies to give a causal interpretation to our findings. We look at major episodes of financial opening over several decades across the globe, rather than minor tweaks in the regulations. We find that when economies open up financially, it is very difficult to detect much of an effect on the level of GDP in the years that follow. And you see this on the left panel. A result which is fully consonant with the voluminous empirical literature that precedes us and that's surveyed in the other book I mentioned. To be sure, our results represent average effects across all of these episodes. But we also discuss how, for example, the quality of financial supervision, the quality of financial inclusion, and a host of other factors that determine the propensity of countries to experience serial crises following financial opening affect the granular results at the country level. And of course, they do. So against the feeble evidence in favor of growth enhancing effects from financial integration, we show that financial opening leads to significant and long lasting effects on inequality. And this you see in the, in the right hand panel. While we investigate a number of channels that might account for this, the data speak loudest in favor of the notion that financial globalization weakens the bargaining power of workers. This is reflected in a significant and persistent decline in the labor share of income in the aftermath of financial liberalization. So I'm going to switch to the second, uh, the second issue, a um, uh, second cause of rising inequality, which uh, relates to fiscal policy. I'd like to start by alluding to some work we did when Olivier Blanchard was the IMF chief economist and that is closely related to Olivier's AEA presidential address on the costs of public debt. It's an issue covered at the beginning of the book's fiscal policy chapter and more fully in a related published paper. We asked the question whether a benevolent government 
trying to maximize the welfare of the average citizen would choose to live with high debt following a debt shock, say in the aftermath of a financial crisis, or instead to run budgetary surpluses to reduce the debt, much as, for example, Germany is doing today. We had in mind countries like Germany that have ample fiscal space, what Moody's, using the methodology we developed, calls green zone countries. Lower debt for such countries, and indeed for any country, confers a couple of important benefits. A reduced burden of debt service in perpetuity and the distortive taxation on which it relies, and a lower probability of experiencing a fiscal crisis, including because there is more fiscal flexibility to deal with shocks. These benefits need to be compared to the transitional costs from raising taxes or cutting productive spending to get the debt down. Our conclusion was that for green zone countries, the welfare benefits of running overall budgetary surpluses to bring down the debt were questionable, and that a strategy of allowing growth or opportunistic revenue increases to organically reduce debt ratios was likely to lead to better outcomes in terms of welfare. Now I'm coming to what's going to be on this slide. If the efficiency benefit of paying down the public debt is questionable, even in a model whose assumptions Joe Stiglitz has described as strongly favoring the case for lower debt, what about the distributional effects? The book takes a fresh look at the distributional consequences of fiscal consolidation relying on a database of fiscal policy actions, tax hikes or spending cuts in OECD countries over the past three decades. We found that episodes of fiscal consolidation lead to significant and persistent increases in inequality, reflecting inter alia the impact on economic activity, employment and unemployment, especially long-term unemployment. These distributional consequences need to be factored into the welfare calculus of fiscal consolidation and into the design of fiscal programs as well. Last part. I want to turn now briefly to the issue of redistributive fiscal policies. The book takes a fresh look at whether the traditional aversion of our profession to these instruments, based on their possible disincentive effects, is justified. Our finding is that looking at the macro data, the, measured, the measures embodied in our fiscal systems do not seem to have it resulted in large disincentive effects, what Arthur Oaken referred to as leaks in the bucket. We can see this by plotting the extent of redistribution achieved by taxes and transfers, which we proxy here on the horizontal axis by the difference between market and disposable income genies, against either growth in the, in the sub subsequent decade, or the level, uh, the level of growth, which is on the left panel, or the duration of growth spells, which is on the right panel. And you can see that these relationships are weak at best. More formally, in models that go beyond simple associations and aim to control for a host of other factors, we find that redistribution can be a win-win policy in the sense that the direct distortive cost appears to be negligible. So these are the uh, sort of second, uh, second bar in that uh, picture. But the resulting reduction in inequality tends to sustain growth. We show this result holds strongly for the median country in our sample, so think of the middle two bars in the picture, and, and more generally for the bottom three quartiles of the global redistribution distribution. Again, the middle two bars. Extreme redistributors, i.e. those in the top quartile of the global redistribution distribution, do indeed incur more, substanti more substantive efficiency costs from further redistribution, consistent with the notion that the distortive effects of these tax and transfer policies are convex, i.e. they rise at a rising rate. Even then, I would note, however, 
the total effect of redistribution on growth is not statistically different from zero. So that's the, the light bar right at the end of this picture. This is important since redistribu redistribution is not undertaken as a growth enhancing device, but rather out of concern to remediate, remediate excessive inequities. In sum, in the macro data, redistribution seems to be either win-win, raising equity and growth, or win-draw. So to conclude, our book urges that macroeconomists should study both the aggregate or average consequences of policies and their distributional effects. In general, policies and reform packages should be designed so that they do not have extreme distributional impacts. The financial crisis taught macroeconomists the value of paying attention to macro financial linkages. The yellow vest protests and the ones that preceded it are a reminder to pay attention to macro distributional linkages. Warnings about secular stagnation have gained currency in recent years. Perhaps the time has come to worry as much about the risk of secular exclusion of so many from the fruits of economic growth. Thank you. Um, so, oh, okay, I'm gonna, that is very loud. So, um, it's a real uh, treat to be able to speak here today at the Peterson Institute. Thank you for inviting me, and um, uh, a real honor to be able to comment on what I think is a fantastic book. So, I'm just gonna put my cards on the table. Um, I really like the book, I really liked the papers. Um, I wanna talk about some uh, implications for the US. Um, but uh, but let me just start by saying you should all buy it. Um, so uh, one of the things, one of the, the words that Jonathan just used to describe um, some of the analysis in the book is the word fresh. And I think that's actually a great way to describe some of the analysis. So I, I might riff on that a little bit. Um, one of the most uh, striking and important things about this book, of course, is that it's a provocative conclusion. This is not the standard set of um, conclusions that we've heard here in Washington, and certainly not ones that um, I think a decade ago we would have thought would have come out of the IMF. So, um, and uh, so that's a, that in and of itself makes it important and urgent reading to understand um, the evidence and to understand this perspective. The other great things about the particular this book is that it's actually quite short, it's quite pithy, it's accessible, and the graphics are fantastic. So they really spend a lot of time making it into something that you can actually read and use. And of course, most importantly, um, the book deals with what I agree with the authors is one of the most important challenges of our time, which is inequality. And they start the, bu the book um, talking about that and, and setting the stage. Uh, the organization that I uh, co-founded and run, the Washington Center for Equitable Growth, has been investigating the question of whether and how inequality affects um, our economy um, over the past five years. Um, and over that time period, we've given away about $4.5 million to scholars, um, all housed in the United States, and um, about 180 grantees. And um, our team works every day to try to make sense of what is mostly microeconomic evidence of the mechanisms through which inequality can affect economic outcomes that lead to um, some of the kinds of um, findings that Jonathan and his team, his, his colleagues, um, found looking across countries. So I think there's a really nice pairing of the kind of work that we've been thinking about and that I would argue is actually on the cutting edge of what's happening in economics and the macroeconomic findings that they have had in this book. When we started um, equitable growth in um, the fall of uh, 2014, I did about 100 informational interviews with various scholars to find out what people thought about our mega, our meta question, how we should think about it, what advice they had. And one thing that kept coming up time and time again was how if you say to an economist, oh, we're looking at inequality and growth, 
um, I would say probably one in four said, oh, that's just that you can't figure out anything with that. Those panel regressions, they're just stupid. You can make them say whatever they want. There's really not a there there. And right about the time that we were doing this was when some of the work that um, uh, the authors uh, were releasing at the IMF that was looking at this in a fresh way, looking at what not just the, the level of growth, but the sustainability of it and asking this question in a different way. And hearing how that conversation has shifted over the past five years among the people that we work with, I think is a testament to the credibility of this research and the, um, the commitment that the scholars have made to making sure that it was both compelling and very serious and high quality. So um, that's just one anecdote, but I think that um, for me it says a lot. Now, of course, um, uh, the IMF and these scholars are not the only people asking this question. and. Um, I would argue that one of the biggest shifts that we're seeing in economics is that you're seeing a lot of scholars asking this question of what inequality or what economists often call heterogeneity or what they typically call heterogeneity means for different economic outcomes. Um, in fact, um, I was at the, uh, at the big economics meetings uh, earlier this month and um, one of the panelists put up a slide that said, it was on a macro panel, um, a slide that was just merely this, the only words on the slide were no more representative agents. Like, oh, wow, that's a pretty big uh, conclusion to make for macroeconomics, that we really do need to be taking heterogeneity into account and that we cannot rely on aggregate metrics to tell us this story. And these are some of the reasons that I actually think this book and this work is so important because it's a different lens into a whole body of work that is emerging that is coming to similar conclusions. But what they're able to do is to make sense of it in a way that allows you to tell a simple story about the macroeconomic aggregate uh, implications. Um, I want to turn to a couple of, um, I will over the course of the next couple of minutes, uh, I focus almost exclusively on the U.S. economy and I want to tease out some implications in, and things that I've noted that connect with this work. Um, one of them uh, is just to, to as I was, uh, uh, I read an early draft of the book, but as I was rereading it to prepare for today, I was really struck how in so many places over the course of the book, they're doing this analysis and coming up with these findings where there are echoes of a whole body of papers coming to similar, similar conclusions focusing on the U.S. case. And one that, of course, is not identical, but uh, a similar vein of work, um, Amir Sufi, uh, Teeth Mian, and Emil Werner have just recently doing some work looking at what happens when states in the United States change their banking regulations to allow banks to work across state lines. So a form of financial deregulation, which is not the same as the um, financial globalization, I, I understand that, but, but a form of thinking about what happens when you change the rules around finance and what does that do to the macro economy? And they found similar in a sort of similar vein that what happens is that while you might see a short-term bump, you actually see these long-term implications for economic stability, that this opening up actually makes state economies less stable, um, and that the downturns have these very severe inequality repercussions. And I wanted to bring that up as just an emblematic piece of the depth of research at the microeconomic level that is actually telling the story for some of the mechanisms that you elevate in your book at the macro level. Um, and that there's a depth there that I think we could all be looking to to tease out what the policy implications are of this work, both at the micro and macro levels, both in advanced countries like the U.S. and in other countries. Um, I think that the, uh, the most important conclusion in this book is the call for, and I quote from page 107, a course correction in the rules of the road that have governed economic policymaking among, among, across much of the world. And that is a quite hefty uh, conclusion that they have made there. Um, it's a big ask for a course correction um, for how we've been thinking about these um, economic policymaking rules. And they say in their introduction, and I will quote here as well, quote, the market gives people, um, um, gives, um, we've, that, too often, that economists have relied on the idea that, quote, the market gives people the idea that just rewards Tinkering with these outcomes too much is both unfair and costly over the longer term because it takes away people's incentives to work hard. In other words, economists have argued that too much of a concern 
about equity, that we've had too, that too much of a concern around equity ends up hurting efficiency. And they use this as a framework for what, they're, what they believe that their evidence is showing, that we, um, that we can no longer step away from the implications around, around equity and only concern ourselves with efficiency as we're thinking about making economic policy. So um, I wanted to spend my last couple of minutes uh, talking about some of the implications, I think, for the United States. And one little, perhaps small ask that I have of your team at the IMF on something we've been working on at Equitable Growth that I'm curious to hear your reactions to and whether or not you think that this is a good route forward. Um, I'm going to show a couple of slides that I'm guessing most of you in the audience have seen, but is a, a bit of a grounding. But first, um, I wanted to just note that they have this great quote, again, in the introduction from Lucas, um, uh, Nobel uh, Laureate Robert Lucas, that they, um, actually, I don't know if that year is the year of the quote or not, um, that they lay out about how th this book really challenges us to rethink this trade-off between equity and efficiency. And... Um, there are a lot of um, uh, ways that we can think about this, but I want to emphasize that what we've been doing for the past 40 years hasn't been working. And so the, the political urgency, I think, of this endeavor to understand what we should be doing in terms of economic policy couldn't be more important. Now, in 1963, John F. Kennedy, um, when he was president, made a speech where he talked about how a rising tide lifts all boats. And um, I think of that speech every time I see this chart from research by Piketty, Saez, and Guzman, uh, Zuckman, that shows, um, looking the bottom, the horizontal axis is the income distribution, and it shows the average growth in national income and what that looks like across the income distribution. And in those years, starting in, this is from 1963 to 1979, it was the case that a rising tide lifts all boats. Two-thirds of American adults saw their income grow at least as much around at least as much as the average, which is 1.7%. If you were poor, you saw your income grow faster. If you're richer, you saw your income grow less. There was this sense in policymaking circles that what we needed to do as economic policymakers is focus on growth and the rest would follow. The distribution was important, but not the focal point, that not the metric of success. And of course, fast forward from 1980, this chart only goes through 2014, the story is starkly different. Only those in the top 10% are seeing the average growth, which means in a very real sense that our metric of success, thinking about GDP, thinking about national income, isn't really giving us the information we need if what we care about is well-being up and down the income spectrum, across a society, across our, an economy. So this question of inequality is important for understanding um, uh, what actual economic success looks like. I will pair this, this trend of rising inequality with, um, and these two lines are the two horizontal lines in those previous charts, again, this is for the US, that over this time period of rising inequality, overall growth in national income has slowed. So this work that they have done to understand what this means, what does inequality mean for growth, and all of this research um, really is looking at an urgent and important question, not just in developing economies, but in advanced economies like the United States as well. One way that um, uh, we have been, we at Equitable Growth have been thinking about this along with um, uh, Piketty, Saez, and Zuckman, is that we need to rethink our metrics of what economic success is. Um, so typically, every quarter, or, you know, every year, when we look at um, the national income and product accounts and we get GDP, we see a chart that looks something like this. This is national income annually in the United States going back to 1963. It's a common visual that we've all seen because we all sort of have a sense of the ebbs and flows of GDP. Um, and this shows an economy that might have a slight downward tilt, you know, sort of a, a, a little bit of a slower growth at the end, but you have this sort of aggregate story that seems like most of the time everything's fine. What we've been working on is thinking about what would happen, oh, I pushed the wrong button, what would happen if we actually pair that data on national income with the data on the income distribution to tell us where growth goes. 
So this is um, from the distribution, the distributional national accounts um, work that uh, Piketty, Saez, and Zuckman have been doing, and um, uh, is now uh, the focus of new legislation that was introduced in the U.S. Congress in the in the fall. Um, that looks at what it what happens if you disaggregate growth, and if you just train your eye for a moment on the green bars, the people that get the money in the U.S. That's green, right? So train your eye on the green bars. Those people are the people in the top one percent. And, and I apologize because green isn't good if you, if you can't see colors very well, but they're the ones at sort of the top. And those have been getting bigger over time. And what that tells you is that even if you have growth in a given year, if that growth is only going to the top, that should tell us about something about our metrics of economic success. So one of the things that we've been thinking about is how can we get more policymakers to take this on as a metric so that the kinds of ideas that Jonathan and Prakash and Andrew and their colleagues are talking about can be better integrated into our everyday thinking about what, um, what is good for, quote unquote, the economy isn't just this aggregate metric, but incorporating inequality, which I think would help elevate many of the policy implications in the path that they talk about. Um, and I just want to end on one sort of final note here that I hemmed and hawed about whether or not to include. But since, um, Jonathan, you started with um, thinking about the protest movements, I will. Um, you know, in the book, you recommend what uh, seems to be, quite frankly, a fairly moderate path forward on, for, for a policy recommendation. And um, I'm inclined sort of characterologically to like moderate paths. Um, that seems like a good idea. And it may be the best path on the economics. But I do think that in rooms like this, we should really be discussing um, whether or not we've allowed things to go too far. Um, where is the, the political moment vis-a-vis -vis both making good economic policy, but addressing the very real frustrations that are grounded in the data and evidence that people are feeling um, in places around the world. And so do we need to push you to have um, conclusions that are a little bit less moderate, a little bit more radical? Um, I think is a question that we should be asking you, um, even if perhaps we might be personally inclined to think that's right on the economics, does that really fit the urgency of the problem in front of us? So thank you. Uh, thanks so much for giving me a chance to um, talk about this book. Um, a little bit over 20 years ago, I was working for Joe Stiglitz at the World Bank, and about half of my job was dealing with the financial crisis, and the other half of my job was trying to stop Joe from criticizing the IMF's dealing with the financial crisis. If you had told me that 20 years later, I'd be discussing a book that Joe had written the forward to by three IMF researchers. Um, would have been quite surprised. Um, and this book is amazing in that there's just, I don't think there's a single new thing in it, and I don't think there's a single thing in it that isn't completely original. And the way you square those two statements is it's a set of papers these authors have written and co-written um, over the last decade that um, have you know plowed entirely original ground on all of these questions. I'd read about half the papers before, in those cases, I enjoyed reading a very accessible um, summary of them, um, and the other half of the papers are now in my to-read pile. So um, that's my first major comment on the book, um, is that it's great and you should read it. My second um, comment on the book is uh, that there's little to disagree with, um, and my third is, uh, but I'll still try. Um, and I'll, I'll put these criticisms um, in context, and many of them are extensions. Uh, so, you know, first of all, it's great. You should read it. Um, we heard an overview, but every chapter has, you know, a different topic. Um, you know, there's things on inequality, which we've talked a lot about, financial liberalization. There's a whole chapter on um, something that was called austerity, a word I was actually surprised to see just even that vocabulary. I don't know, Vitor, if you allowed that or not. Um, and looking at it in exactly the right way, doing a cost-benefit test of, of course, lower debt is better. We'd all rather have lower debt, but it costs us something to get there. How much better off are we with a low debt? Um, what's the cost of getting there? Um, monetary expansions, I was glad to see a chapter on that, um, et cetera. 
Um, what I wanted to jump into was one question that we've sort of danced around and discussed in a number of ways, um, which is I think more research recently finds inequality is bad for growth. I think some of the results that you've seen in different research has been mixed and fragile. Um, I can say Joe Stiglitz and I did a paper for Jackson Hole in 1998. We viewed it as quite a triumph when we found no relationship between them, because then we could run around and say all these people that were saying, you know, redistribution, all the stuff is bad for growth. You know, there's no relationship. Um, this book is quite precise about when it's dealing with inequality um, and when it's dealing with redistribution. I'm still a little bit skeptical of trying to formulate a grand theory on all of this. And part of why I'm a little bit skeptical is that I read chapter four, I think it is, of the book. And chapter four of the book has a whole lot of policies that go in different directions. Every one of these policies, according to the analysis in the book, if you look at for countries as a whole, raises growth and raises inequality. It's a lot of what we do in economic policy. So I don't think we've gotten to a sort of grand unified, all good things go together. Um, I think we've rebutted the opposite view um, that the only way you can have growth is with more inequality. And I think that by itself is important, um, but I don't think we have a grand unified theory. Um, second is, um, and this applies to some of the book, and it applies, frankly, to more things outside of the book that aren't by these authors, um, which is it's unclear how to interpret it um, when the right-hand side variable is inequality. But the thing we're interested in as policymakers is policies to reduce inequality. So imagine one model, inequality leads to populism, and that means you get anti-growth policies like tariffs. Now there's another model that's the opposite. Inequality leads to plutocrats being in charge and they stop the things that you do that are in favor of growth. Both of those will look exactly the same in the reduced form. Both of those will have more inequality is bad for growth. They have really different implications um, for policy debates. So some of the inequality on growth is an important social science question. Policymakers need to know about policies for growth Fortunately, the book has an awful lot of that um, as well, and we've heard some of that. Um, but some of the times when I just see the inequality by itself, I'm left wondering, you know, is it model one or is it model two? Um, the third one, and this is to some degree an extension of the book, um, that the authors do a lot where they show us the effect on growth, they show us the effect on distribution, and they don't combine the two. And I think in part that's because the authors didn't want to take a moral stance on the relative importance of people at different parts of the income distribution. The problem is anything we do is taking a moral stance. Growth is a particular mapping from different incomes at different points of time that adds them all up, takes the log, and subtracts. You could multiply them, you could add the squares of them, you could add the logs of them, you could you know, do whatever you wanted. This is one particular function. It has embedded in it, um, it feels like it doesn't have any moral view embedded in it. It feels like growth is a neutral thing and distribution is some you know, moral class warfare thing. Um, that's not true of at all. It has a moral view embedded in it. And it has one that I don't think any of us would actually agree with. I don't think there's anyone that would defend um, the example of a billionaire making an additional billion annually, a million low-income households losing 900 annually, and thinking that had made the world um, a better place. Um, there's, of course, no a priori relevance to a Gini coefficient. If you asked me, would I rather a country have a Gini coefficient of 42, index of 42 or 38, you know, I'd much rather be in a rich country with 42 than a poor country with 38. So again, um, that doesn't have an a priori normative. Um, you have to be able to combine those two. And, you know, that's really important. I don't know if you can, oh, you can see these, good. Um, this is their analysis. Um, this is for um, middle and low income countries. And it shows a set of policies. And I'll just take these as given. The left-hand bar is the impact on growth. The right-hand bar is the impact on inequality. And let's say we were sure these results were right. And you're a policymaker. You have to decide, you know, which of these you're gonna do, which are you not gonna do. Um, it's really easy to rule out network reforms, collective bargaining, that's reduced collective bargaining, by the way, um, and capital account liberalization, because all three of those hurt growth and increase inequality. So, you know, you wouldn't want to do those. Um, you definitely do want rule of law, um, because that helps growth, and it doesn't hurt inequality. 
Um, what about domestic financial reforms, current account liberalization, and tariff reforms? I don't know, like one bar is bigger than the other. Do you like them? Do you not like them? Um, we need some way of combining those. Um, to step back, just to do an abstract experiment, and then we'll get back to these. France has a genie of 0.29. Let's say it went up to 0.33. Um, how much growth would you need to justify that? Like, just form a thought in your head as to which of those you think is a reasonable answer. Um, you know, it depends on your social welfare function, of course. Um, I think a reasonable one is utilitarian. Um, people's happiness is roughly related to the log of their income. And you add up the log of their income. That actually doesn't have any redistributive um, bias in it. Um, if you do that, it turns out that a one point increase in the Gini index is equal to about a three percentage point decline in the mean of log income minus the log of mean income. So you can multiply that change by three. So that would get you about 12. So you need about 12% increase in the level of output to justify France moving from its inequality to the inequality that Australia and Portugal have. If you have any inequality aversion, which I think most of us do and is built into a lot of the way we think about policies, you might want to multiply by something like five. So taking that back to the, oh, so 15 was the correct answer. Um, uh, so taking that back to it, this is where we were before. Um, this says you don't want to do domestic finance reforms. You don't want to do current account liberalization. Um, but that, Adam, you do not need to fire me from the Peterson Institute because you do need to do um, tariff reforms. In that case, the increase in inequality is 1.5 Gini points. The increase in the level of output is 12%. That level of output swamps the increase in inequality. And that's a case where a trade-off is worth doing as opposed to um, domestic finance reforms, where at least in these numbers, um, they're not worth doing. Um, I think we always have to take a moral stance. If you're at the IMF, maybe you don't want to take a particular one. So you can do what they do at the OECD when they do the multidimensional living standards and show two different social welfare functions, two ways to combine them. Otherwise, I don't know any policymakers that could take a look at those two bars and know what they should be doing in any one of those circumstances. So show people a menu of options, explain them, explain what's underlying them, let people choose whether they're sort of log utilitarian type of people, inequality aversion type of people, or maybe normal people. Um, just to conclude, um, the next book that I'd love to see um, partly builds on what's already here, um, distinguishing factors um, and policies that push growth in the same and different directions, um, focus on policies on inequality, which there's an awful lot of in this book, um, growth that's um, inequality that's good or bad for growth. Um, and you know, then I'd love to see more micro, less macro. One thing you can do with the micro data is all the macro is pretty much contemporaneous. Um, the micro lets you look at redistribution today and the impact on the children of that family's income 20 or 30 years from now. I think we're seeing some tremendous results there, which are positives from redistribution that wouldn't show up in any of the regressions um, in this book. And then to the degree we're focused on macro, you know, more things on the left-hand side that look like social welfare and lay your cards on the table, say what you're assuming about social welfare, as opposed to thinking um, that you're not doing anything with social welfare when you put growth on the left-hand side, because you still are um, even in that case as well. Um, so I can't wait for, uh, for this next book. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Jonathan. If I could ask the three co-authors and two discussants to come up, we have name cards for you. While they're coming up, I'm going to exercise the chair's prerogative and make a couple quick comments. Obviously, I also like the book, uh, or else we wouldn't have had this event. Um, but I, I do want to emphasize and pick up on a couple things that were said. And these are not so much criticisms of the book, but they are about getting from the book to the kinds of answers we need. The first is it's all well and good to talk about the yellow vests or the Seattle protesters and all those in between. But it is not necessarily true empirically or analytically 
that the people who claim to be protesting inequality are actually protesting inequality. As I pointed out at AEA a few weeks ago, in fact, it could be the reverse. We see an awful lot of white males of wealth, relative wealth, in Western societies who are protesting increased equality, who don't want to see threats to their social standing and their relative position from people of color, from women, or from poor people around the world. And so as much as we think about this, we do have to be a little careful in a political economy sense about mapping from inequality to legitimacy of protest and from fixing inequality to getting the social peace you want. The second point I would make, which is closely related, is I love Jason's seven policies, not just because the tariffs come out the right way, which we knew they would. Um, remember, we say things because we know they're true, or at least believe they're true. Um, you know, the, I think we do need to address not just the questions of the trade-off with the kinds of moral welfare functions that uh, Jason and others were referring to, but I think we also need to think about it in very practical terms. What buys people off? And it's not just about buying people off in the narrow sense that we want to maintain the status quo for Starbucks to never be taxed. It is about not about buying people off in the sense of what is most effective for delivering stability. Because as Jonathan, Andrew, and Prakash document very well in their papers and in the book, bouts of instability followed by irregular microeconomic policies actually make matters worse. And so we need a political economy assessment of what kinds of programs buy people off in the right way. The third point I would make, and then turn it back over to our colleagues, and in particular Prakash will respond to the discussions, is that Heather in particular, but also Jonathan and, and Jason, but especially Heather, I think, was quite white to take on the direct challenge of the Lucasian uh, worldview, which also he's going back to his AEA presidential address was saying, once you start thinking about differences in growth, it's hard to start think about anything else. And we have since discovered quite rightly, well, no, you have to think about something else. So I want to commend her for that. But I just want to give a call to action, which my team here at the Peterson has heard me say a few times in recent months, and to our colleagues on the practical side of the profession. It's not enough to just flip back and forth and say we need more micro than macro. We need macro people, including at the fund, to be willing to go out there and assess what specific forms of policies do the most good or bad and what are the trade-offs. And that includes such thorny issues as deciding about corporate tax cuts and deciding about different forms of public investment. And this is something macro people have shied away from doing, partly because it's so politically frustrating and partly because it takes more work than doing macro. I think, however, we are going to have to do the work. <laughs> anyway, let me turn to Prakash, please. Uh, thanks very much, Adam. Thanks for hosting us. Um, I just actually wanted to just open it up, but just use the occasion to thank both uh, Jason and Heather for their comments. Uh, I think we are all on the same page here. I think the objective of our book was limited. It was limited by the research that we have done so far. And the research has been to show that pretty much any policy that you can think of, including many of the policies that we at the IMF have been recommending, have very important distributional consequences. But to us, that was a first step, and as some of the comments from the discussions have hinted, it, it took us a bit of a struggle to even get that, that point to be made and acknowledged uh, within the IMF. And Jason, it was indeed uh, a step forward to say, we can't keep writing fiscal consolidation when everyone else is saying austerity, even if uh, it's uh, an awkward moment for the funds. And in the end, we did win the battle to I'd been wondering what fiscal consolidation was. Yeah, it's austerity. <laughs> okay. uh, no, so, so I think uh, the point I'm trying to make is that the book's objective is to try to convince you that very few policies do not have 
strong distributional effects. The exception that you saw in one of the slides that Jason showed was the rule of law. That was really the only policy we could find where um, the impact on inequality is not very strong. Um, so the, the other thing I wanted to say is that even though the results that we are, all have been talking about focus on the Gini, in the book we also show similar results for the labor share. Uh, so I think it's not tight. We don't nail down the issue of what social welfare function to use, but uh, depending on the context, you might prefer different ones. So it's not just the genie, it's the labor share, it's the top 1%, the top 5%. So that to me, the increase in inequality is very widespread, and I think you would have to have a pretty strange so social welfare function, write it out in a way that you say, well, regardless of these effects on all these different measures of inequality, I'm still sort of okay with this, with this outcome. Um, I also sort of agree with uh, Heather's point and with Jason's that the next step has, has got to be to think through uh, what are the policies that we can recommend to people. If you are convinced that taking into account the distributional impacts of policies in, is important, then we agree that the next step is to think about what sorts of policies uh, sh should really matter. And we hope to uh, come back in 10 years with, uh, with another book. But meanwhile, uh, as Jason said about this one, it's great you should read it. I just wanted to remind you that buying it is a prerequisite to reading it, so, uh, <laughs> uh, and it is for sale outside. Thanks. <laughs> Wow, and I thought I was the shameless promoter. Good job, Prakash. Um, thank you all very much. Unless Andrew would like to add something at this juncture, I will open it up to the floor. This is being webcast live. It is on the record. And please, if you could come either to the standing mic or flag Jessica with the traveling mic, and please identify yourself before Hi, asking a question. My name is Joe Marie Grease Grabber. I'm with New Rules for Global Finance, and I've been butting heads with the IMF for about 30 years. And I am, I'm tempted to ask for your ID cards to make sure you're from the IMF, but I know you well. Um, I do want to ask an inter, intra-institutional question, and how are your policy recommendations being implemented by mission chiefs as they make their rounds? Okay. Collecting questions? No, no, you get to answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, please. So first I'd like to thank the organizers and our discussants. And a shout out to my son, Noah, who I think is watching this. On the Go, screen. Noah. Uh, obviously, that's a sore spot for, 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 that's been a big part of the discussion that followed on from this work, which is how much is it internalized by country teams? How much do we really say on the ground? And part of the, the challenge really is, is, is relates to the issues that were raised by uh, some of the, dis the discussions, which is that it's, it's hard to go from these results to really granular recommendations. And so there's been a lot of effort to sort of, uh, to, to, to at least get teams to raise these issues with the authorities. And how that gets raised depends on the country. You know, there may be a reference to micro studies. There may be just simply incidence analysis done in the context of the discussions with the authorities. There's a lot of the ways it could happen. They're not taking coefficients from regressions and kind of applying them to, to conditionality or something simple-minded like that. There has been work. Again, it's going on this idea that, that you know, we have to get more micro. That's clearly true. Where you know, we as a, as a profession, or perhaps we as an institution, although I'm certainly not speaking for the institutions, need to get uh, more micro. And there is work underway that that follows on and what Heather was saying about the role of heterogeneous agents of getting getting different types of people into the models. And and we have put some time into building some of those models. And there's just a, some recent analysis being done on the case of Bolivia, uh, sorry, Nigeria, looking at the distributional consequences of multiple exchange rate regimes, using a, a sort of micro macro model like that, calibrated to, to micro data, to ask the question about who will win and who will lose with certain kind of different policies on dual exchange rates. And that's the kind of thing that I think can get granular enough to provide insight for policymakers, and then they can apply essentially their social welfare function. Really helpful, thank you. Another question, please, or comment? Please, over here. 
Thank you. Jack Goldstone from George Mason University. I want to follow up on something Jason suggested for the next book. I think this book is fantastic, speaks for itself. But Jason referred to social mobility. And inequality at a given time is one issue. But what people really care about are their prospects over time and the prospects for their children. You can have a society like China, which goes from poor to rich. If you look at inequality, it's getting worse. But social mobility is positive because everyone is getting better off. You can have other societies where inequality is rising more slowly, but people are deeply concerned. As Adam said, the yellow vest, they're concerned that elites are blocking their way forward. They're concerned that minorities and women are taking up the remaining channels because they're not confident that they or their children will be better off than they are today. How do you address that dynamic intergenerational micromatter? Thank you. Would any of you care to comment? And obviously our discussants can as well. I, I was going to pass it on to Heather because I know her think tank has done a lot of work. There were sessions that you folks organized uh, at the AEA meetings this year on social mobility. We don't tackle it in the book, by the way. It's not a theme. Of the book. Yeah, I think it's, a, it's an incredibly important issue, and I'm glad you raised it. And it almost always comes up um, in conversations that I'm in around you know, the question of inequality. Um, I do think that it's important to recognize, um, and I haven't seen international evidence on this, but um, we do know some from some research for the United States um, from a team headed by Raj Chetty and a number of other uh, economists that when you look at absolute mobility in the United States, um, it's fallen sharply. So among the cohort born in 1940, about 90% um, of people grew up to earn, out earn their parents. Among those born in 1980, only about half are, are out earning their parents. Um, but if we actually want to close the gap between those two cohorts, um, you only close about 30% of that gap if you focus on growth. Um, they do some counterfactuals. If I had slides, I could explain it all. But, but you, you, you close some of that gap by, by having better economic growth. But the real bang for the buck in closing that gap is actually reducing inequality. So about 70% of the difference between the 1940 cohort and the 1980 cohort could be undone if you actually had the, um, the if you started with the income distribution that the 1940 cohort had. So that actually, I think, circles back. So I think what's interesting is that the questions of mobility are often, just as you said, that's what people care about. They care about their children, their, you know, how well they're going to do. Um, and we've, I think, often looked at those as sort of somewhat separate issues. And I think part of what this research shows us is that we actually need to be thinking about them as the same issue. That is the, as Chetty and his colleagues put it, as the rungs on the ladder get further apart, that actually is inequality widens. That actually has this really significant effect on mobility as well. And we need to be thinking about that both from the top down, the opportunity, um, the opportunity hoarding at the top, but also from the bottom up and whether or not fiscal austerity is um, leading to the lack of investment in the kinds of uh, policies that help people move up the ladder. Can I say something super fast? Please. Um, these authors could not write a book on international social mobility because we don't have yeah, well, the data for them to write that book. Five years ago, we couldn't answer the most basic questions about trends in mobility in the United States because of Raj and co-authors' work that Heather was talking about. We now know a massive amount more about it. So the first step I'd suggest, and it's probably not for the three of them, is to just start to put together data. You know, either the IMF, the OECD might be the more natural place, so that we're actually collecting this data across countries. We have the descriptions. And once we have that, then we can start to do the analysis. Thanks very much. Uh, Yes, over there, please. Thanks, Suita Douche with the uh, Policy Center for the New South and Google. Um, so the after tax and transfers level of inequality doesn't fully tell the picture. Uh, I'd like to get your views on this. Uh, in the United States, there's big philant philanthropy uh, going on and uh, something like $200 billion a year are uh, transferred. Um, this is not accounted for in the, in the post uh, uh, tax and transfers numbers. Uh, what do you think about that? What do you think about the argument that it's okay if we're rich, we just give it away at some point and everybody's better off anyway? Sorry, the, the second point, or could you just restate it? Are you saying it's okay if the rich get all the money because then they're charitable to places like us? 
Or are you saying that it's, <laughs> are you saying it's different for rich <laughs> countries than poor countries? I honestly didn't follow. I think philanthropy is a big feature in the United States. Yeah. I'm, I'm asking, I have an answer to the question as, as most people do, uh, but I'm asking, I'm interested in the views of the panel on uh, whether philanthropy is having a major effect on redistribution or if you like, in correcting the inequality that exists after you look at uh, transfers and taxes of the government. That's Thank all. you. Can I suggest that our authors of the book respond to the first question and then Heather or Jason, who have more detailed knowledge of the U.S. system, respond to the second? It's not obvious to me that, the, that you know, if people get gifts, that it's not included in the post-tax and transfer. You, you could be right, but it's, it's certainly not obvious to me that, the, that that is. There are things that are omitted from, uh, you know, there are in-kind transfers that might not be included, but... But um, but it's not obvious to me that the philanthropy issue uh, is 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 looms very large in the data. I, I just would would say that um, uh, you know some people go much further uh, than I think your question is, which is uh, you know we, we saw some articles coming out of Davos that redistribution is a terrible idea. Philanthropy can do this job much better. So this is um, this is something we we obviously need to contend with as an argument. I think one re riposte to that was so the rich have all the income, they have all the uh, wealth, and then they have all the esteem because they give it away. So that that might be the world that we're moving to. They also give it away to hospitals, universities, and museums, which isn't you know exactly the, quite the same thing as the earned income tax credit. Right. It also isn't democratic, right? Um, so, I mean, to, just to sort of say the obvious that the, um, you know, one of the challenges with the philanthropic community, wonderful as it is, and I run a 501c3, so I'm a huge fan of um, people <laughs> who give away their money. Um, but the, the idea that it could be of the scale or of the purpose that government can do through the tax and transfer system um, it seems uh, uh, hard to reconcile with the idea that we, those of us who live in democracies, think that people should have some say about what that public purpose is and what the priorities of a government are. And philanthropy literally takes all, strips all of that away. So I think one of the things, and one of the things that you're hearing about a lot in the philanthropic um, community in the United States is real questions about the about um, as it becomes larger and there's all these new living donors, how those priorities are being set and by whom, um, uh, as opposed to that money going into the public coffers where there's some democratic process to decide whether or not what, what that priority is. Right. One, one last brief thing also. Redistribution might increase charitable giving, not reduce it. When you raise taxes on a high-income yeah. household, you have an income effect, they have less income. You have a substitution effect, which is, the relative cost of giving to charity as opposed to consumption has gone down. And certainly studies of the estate tax, for example, finds that it increases charitable giving. And, um, don't, win -win. and don't we also know that in the U.S. data, it's actually some of the lowest income people give highest percentages to charity. So if you're looking at the aggregate, yeah. it might change as well. Yep. Uh, this will be our last question due to the time limits. So I'm going to go back to the Could question. Could you please identify? Ted Truman, Ted Truman here at the Peterson Institute, excuse me. Uh, going to back to the question, the next, the previous question. So how do you, maybe I should ask this to the authors, I think. How do you answer the China question, right? Where, at least I think it's, where income distribution has dramatically worsened, right? And uh, but growth, maybe it passes. Maybe the answer is it passes Jason's test, if I may put it that way. If that's the answer, that probably probably is the answer. Maybe that's the answer. But how do you? Is that your answer to well, how you answer the to the China the China question? Uh, uh, and presumably there are other examples in this world where where that if that passes the China the China passes that that may also pass the Furman test, if I put it that way. So Ted, um, 
That's a, that's a question that, that we get a lot. It, it's not necessarily uh, framed to be about China. It's typically, um, there's this country that I know very well where uh, income distribution has deteriorated and it's grown well, or uh, income distribution's been very equal and it's grown poorly. So this, this comes to macro work versus m micro work. Um, certainly now um, uh, you have a period where in China income distribution is deteriorating. Uh, you had a period when it first opened up and it deteriorated and grew very well. You have Brazil when Lula came to power where um, uh, inequality was out of hand. He did a lot to bring it down um, and the economy grew very well. You know, I could, if, I, if I had a few more minutes, I could give you 10 examples on each side. The point is... What is there any information in sort of the average result from all of these growth episodes? That's what we uh, have tried to show rather than sort of picking and choosing. Uh, I think, Prakash, you want to add one thing about our work on China. I, I just wanted to add that we have been looking at more in more detail at, at China. So it, indeed, you know, it's, it's a great growth story. So it's difficult to look at that data and, and make it sound like a disaster because inequality has gone up. But even when you start to look in more detail, going to, again, Heather's point about at the micro level, you do see that there are big pockets of people. And in China, even these are, these are of course, going into the millions now, where you don't see the growth going to, 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 to people with very low education. You don't see growth going to people in some, some parts of these, of, of, of these provinces. So it's not as, of course, it's a, overall such a great growth story that you know, that's what you're going to hear 90% of the time. But when you start looking at the, at the micro data for China, which we now are, you will see that there are what uh, Jonathan called secular exclusion. So China has been growing now for 20, 30, 40 years, and there are people there who have not seen virtually any of the gains of growth. So I think that would be our point. Thank you very much. Thank you to Jason Furman and Heather Bushi for providing their perspective, but thank you especially to Prakash Langani, Andrew Berg, and Jonathan Ostry for sharing with us today their new book, Confronting Inequality. So much. Is it good or bad?